Hi, everyone. We'll begin in just 60 seconds. We're just giving everyone a second to get into the Zoom. Okay, we're gonna get started. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Alter. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Tech for Campaigns. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're really lucky to be joined by some special guests. Um, I just wanna quickly give you a background in case you're not familiar with Tech for Campaigns. We're building the lasting digital and tech arm for the Democrats. We provide best-in-class technology, talent, and training to centrist and progressive campaigns. And one of the coolest parts is that we're powered by a community of 12,000 skilled volunteers, some of whom are on this Zoom today. Um, we do this because despite the Obama era tech prowess, Democrats today are far behind Republicans on both technology and digital, spending about five to 10 cents of every dollar donated. Um, at least pre-COVID, um, while Trump spends about 40 cents. So um, <clears throat> in the last two and a half years, we've scaled to help over 250 campaigns on over 400 digital projects across 22 states. And we have three products that are used across campaigns. If you want to volunteer, um, if you're a digital marketer or anything close to it, um, or you have tech skills, you can do so right on our website. Um, and we're hiring. Part of our mission is to bring the tech and political world closer together. So we started the tech and politics series um, as a way to do this and pair a tech and a political leader to have an open dialogue and share different perspectives. Today, we're all in for a treat. We're gonna hear from two individuals who really need no introduction, but I'm gonna give them one anyway. Um, Frida Kapoor Klein is an entrepreneur, activist, and pioneer in the field of organizational culture and diversity. She's a founding partner of Kapoor Capital, the Kapoor Center for Social Impact, and Project Include. Um, her work really focuses on diversifying the workforce by closing gaps of access, opportunity, or outcome for low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, and she's really a driving force of change for workforce and organizational diversity in the public and private sectors. And Representative Colin Allrad represents the 32nd District of Texas in the U.S. House of Representatives. After playing linebacker for the Tennessee Titans for five seasons, he enrolled in Berkeley Law to fulfill his dream of becoming a civil rights attorney and began his political career as Secretary Julian Castro's special assistant and in 2018 went on to win a seat in Texas. Um, so we're really excited. Uh, we're gonna talk mostly about the intersection of tech and politics today. I'm here to moderate, not just interview. Um, and there'll be a few minutes at the end for questions. So um, Frida and Congressman Allred, thank you so much for being here today. We're all tuning in from home. So I think it's only fitting to start by talking about COVID-19 and the immense impact it's having on everyone. Um, Specifically, given where you guys have focused a lot of your career, I wanted to talk about COVID's disproportionate impact on people who are less economically stable and on African American community. Um, you know, African Americans are about 18% <clears throat> of the population, but they re represent a third of hospitalizations um, in major cities. The stats are much worse. I'd love to hear what you guys are both seeing in the communities you work in and um, what levers you think we can pull to address some of the inequitable impact now and in the future. And Frida, I'll just tap you to start. Great, well, first of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to meet Congressman Allred. Um, Yes, the COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on African-American and Latinx and Native American communities. 
uh, and you're absolutely right about the disproportionate impact. I think where I really want to start, though, is we've got a problem with structural racism, and it's the structural racism that leads to the over-representation, if you will, in low-income communities of color of the underlying conditions. So we started with an enormous gap of health disparities and all of the preconditions that leave one more vulnerable to COVID-19 are more uh, prominent or prevalent in low-income communities of color. So until we fix things like the disproportionate impact of pollution in low-income communities of color, uh, which leads to the disproportionate rates of asthma. Uh, until we fix things like food deserts and food insecurity, uh, we're not going to make a dent in issues like diabetes that are also uh, where that is also a precondition. So I think the, the what's been laid bare by this crisis is the intersection of all of the inequities that have been going on for a long time leading to this horrible moment. Representative Allred. Well, I certainly agree that COVID-19 is holding up a mirror uh, to our society uh, and showing us things that have always existed but have not always gotten uh, the attention it deserves. Uh, and certainly uh, the disparate impacts of this, not just of the virus itself, but also the economic impacts uh, are, are being very clearly shown. And I, in, in Dallas County here, uh, we have about 80% of the hospitalizations are what are called essential workers. Uh, and we've, there's been some studies shown uh, that our essential workers are disproportionately women and women of color and people of color. Uh, and so we're talking about communities um, that, as Frida was mentioning, disproportionately have instances of uh, diabetes, hypertension, uh, other uh, cancers that uh, can exacerbate the lethality of this virus. And so uh, the impacts are, are just so disproportionate. And I can tell you as a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, we are talking about this every single day. Uh, it is very, very much on our mind. We're also asking workers now in Texas to go back to work without sufficient protective equipment uh, and without sufficient um, OSHA regulations in place to protect them in the workplace. Uh, but another thing I, I think that particularly for this group uh, that I would highlight uh, is the uh, disparate uh, access to broadband high-speed internet uh, mm -hmm. that we are now seeing really uh, shown clearly, um, especially when our schools are closed, as they should be, uh, and kids are being asked to learn from home, uh, and people are being asked if they can to work from home. Uh, the uh, lack of high-speed internet is being very clearly shown in Dallas. We have uh, some... Uh, uh, philanthropic foundations that are working hard to try and spread uh, access to hotspots and things like that, but it re it's really putting a Band-Aid over, you know, a gaping wound. Uh, and then the bill that we're considering now in Congress, the CARES Act 2.0, if you will, uh, access to high-speed internet is very much uh, something that we've been discussing a, a lot. And although everything for us is subject to negotiation with the Senate and, and the White House, uh, it's a huge priority for us and has been for many, many months. I mean, uh, Jim Clyburn, who is uh, the highest ranking African American in Congress, of course, uh, has been uh, evangelizing about this for years and years and years. And uh, it's very clear now uh, that we need to act on this and make sure that everyone has access to high speed internet. You can't compete in the modern economy or get a, an education in this era without it. If I could jump in there, um, I am a proud member of Congresswoman Barbara Lee's district uh, and your colleague on the Congressional Black Caucus and one of the leaders of, uh, tech, of the Congressional Black Caucus's Tech 2020 initiative. And so she comes out to the Bay Area every year with a, with a delegation from the CBC uh, and we meet with them and, and talk about ways that they should be asking Silicon Valley to come to the table. Um, but I want to underscore um, what you said. Um, and 18 years ago, I founded a program called SMASH, Summer Math and Science Honors, uh, smash.org for low-income underrepresented high school students of color. We're on 10 campuses. We're gonna have to be all virtual this summer. We're not yet in Texas, but maybe you and I could fix that. Uh, <laughs> and we, um, so the program is a three summer residential program and it changes the trajectory of, of our scholars' lives. So after three summers in SMASH, 
half of the kids go on to top 1% colleges. We graduate kids from college who went to SMASH at 4x the national average. That means with comparing them with privileged kids, they're graduating four times as often with a STEM degree from college. So we know that the, that the program works. But our SMASH scholars around the country, the high school students, are out of high school. And to underscore what Congressman Allred said, we just surveyed them. 41% of them have no education going on now. None, zero, zip. They are going to fall farther and farther and farther behind. They are never going to get this time back. This is a travesty that we need to fix. And, and so as the Congressman said so eloquently, this laid bare um, putting a mirror to our society and has amplified the digital divide that's been there um, and needs needs fixing as much as the healthcare system needs fixing. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I want to even add on to that and then ask, I think one of the biggest um, systems that's been stressed in addition to education is the unemployment system. And I'm just going to throw up a quick um, slide because this one actually stopped me in my tracks yesterday. Um, and it, thank you to the, to the member of my team who found this, but um, a bunch of us have seen that um, COBOL, which is a programming language from the 1970s, is being used by many states, at least four that we found, and the Social Security Administration. But then this is what really stopped me in my tracks yesterday. Washington, D.C. has asked unemployed workers to follow their applications using Internet Explorer, which is a browser that Microsoft retired five years ago. And, and aside from just that doesn't make sense, it actually doesn't work on the phone. And that is when what, where one in four uh, low-income adults access the Internet. So. I throw this up in a way to ask where where can we help on the governmental side make sure that they're using technology and systems that um, can provide for all of the people that need it. Well, I, I have to say that I, to me, it's not just uh, the unemployment system in the various states, which state to state, you're hearing disastrous uh, results. Florida, Texas is having huge problems as well. New Jersey, I've heard about, of course, with their system and asking old coders to come back and try to help them figure out how to update this. So this is a result in many ways of the systematic underfunding of agencies for decades now. Uh, and now we're asking them to do tremendous uh, workloads with reduced uh, personnel and ancient technology in those, that, those agencies. I, I worked in the Obama administration at, at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, as you mentioned. Um, we have this problem there uh, using very old technology. Uh, the workforce is about half what it was when Ronald Reagan came, uh, left office, I should say. Uh, and so it's been significantly cut back. Uh, and so the ability to be nimble and to respond to crises is just not there. And some of the big programs that we're discussing, uh, whether it's the Paycheck Protection Program or Paycheck Guarantee Program that's being discussed now, uh, which mm. is to guarantee the paycheck to folks, would have to be administered uh, by either IRS or SBA uh, or other agencies that have been the subject of attacks for years and years and years saying that uh, they need to, to be cut back. And, and now we're asking them to do things that are way beyond uh, the scope of, of what they're normally able to do. And so they have to begin by kind of ending the belief uh, that uh, any investment in our governmental systems is waste of money uh, because I think we're seeing that now when folks desperately need the government to be able to respond, uh, our, our ability to respond is limited. Um, but I'll, I will say this for folks who wanna engage with uh, their local governments or, and with the states, um, this is also time to plan and to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And so uh, you can, we need to be having these discussions about what do we need to update and how do we need to update it. The funding uh, is going to be uh, in many ways uh, there because we are trying to use everything we can to uh, get these resources out there. And you're seeing that nearly $3 trillion worth of funding has already been approved to mitigate the impacts of this virus. Uh, and so the funding is, is going to be continuing on that side. And people are looking for any answer that they can uh, to more efficiently administer these programs. So 
I think it's a time to contact your state rep or your state senator or your member of Congress if you are able to, to provide any assistance or have the expertise to, to help update some of these things and you have the logistical expertise to make it more efficient. I don't think it would be turned away. Uh, now, it's not going to happen overnight and all that, but I think that we need to have much more transmission between uh, the tech community and government uh, and so that we can be much more efficient. And we're not even talking about, of course, contact tracing and things like that, which I know we'll probably discuss later. I would just add, I think we need to be working on uh, the immediate crisis and relief there as we plan for, uh, as we fix systems that are in, uh, in place now that are critical, like filing for unemployment, and that we work, as the Congressman is saying, on the longer term investment and solutions. So we need, I think we need to do all of those things now. One of the ways in which there's been a really fabulous public-private partnership launched in California with Governor Newsom, and Texas is on the roadmap, is something called onwardca.org that launched, oh goodness, I wanna say four weeks ago now. Um, and it's launched in 10 other uh, states and the and the District of Columbia. And it provides three things for people who've just lost a job. First is emergency relief. If you need food brought to you tomorrow, if you need childcare to help you go um, uh, look for a job, um, you can get that emergency re relief. You can also find out about job training available in your geography. And the third resource Onward connects you to is open positions in your geography that uh, take advantage of your skills. So it's not just a static database, it's an active algorithm driven uh, matching. So far in four weeks, almost 400,000 Californians have been matched to one of those three resources. We're now covering 35% of the US. And I wanna say the platform was built by 20 women of color in an apprenticeship program at Bitwise Industries. And I should disclose, we are an investor in Bitwise Industries, and we are an investor because we invest in gap-closing tech startups at Cape War Capital. But I think it's a perfect example of when you bring a tech for campaign style effort together with a real need, um, amazing things can happen, and we need to be doing more of these public-private partnerships. I guess the one thing I would ask is um, how do we change, and I think especially for this crowd, how do we change the mindset on the government side that um, at least if you look at the systems that are being used and how often they're not being updated, it seems like it's really honestly a value and a mindset issue. So if you don't think that the tech matters, if you don't think that the systems matter that much, you're not going to spend money to update them even after a crisis like this. And so how do we help change that mindset? I think pilot programs uh, and uh, public-private partnerships are a really smart way to get started when you can uh, show the amount of money that can be saved by increased efficiency. I guarantee you that that's when uh, the kind of pencil pushers will get going on trying to switch over. And uh, when I was at HUD, we had a program called Connect Home, of the public-private partnership trying to put high-speed internet uh, in our public housing units. Uh, and the idea there was to just take a pilot, show that it could work, show the uh, providers, uh, the internet providers, that they would get additional customers as well, uh, and show the, the uh, positive results happening in those public housing facilities. Unfortunately, our administration ended and, and that program has kind of uh, uh, fizzled out. But I think that uh, pilot programs that can be used as case, uh, case examples of the positive interactions that can happen when you increase tech fluency, when you increase efficiency, uh, I think that's the best way to really prevent solid evidence. Or of course, states like California with what you're doing, uh, with that incredible program, uh, that's of course, those are great examples as well. Uh, but I really feel like Showing that you'll save money and time uh, is always the best way uh, to get government to respond. I think also increasing the tech literacy of our elected officials is important. Um, and I think there are a bunch of ways to do that. My husband, Mitch Kapor, actually suggested to Congresswoman Barbara Lee 
that the CBC and the Congressional Hispanic Caucus think about bringing on board a CTO, a chief technology officer. Um, it was um, it, cringeworthy moments as we watched various members of Congress try to grill tech executives um, who just slithered out of any accountability. Um, and so I think helping to equip our elected officials with more tech literacy would be a great uh, use of funding and would uh, really um, come to the benefit of the whole country. Absolutely, and I'll just add that right now when we're, we're having to try to govern remotely, uh, we are learning just how tech, um, <laughs> let's just say un under underutilize the, the tech abilities of some of my colleagues are. Uh, and, uh, you know, that does make it harder for us to conduct oversight, to uh, interact with one another, to be public and, and have public interactions so that there can be visibility into what we're doing. Uh, I and a number of my freshman colleagues have been, you know, pushing pretty hard to try and increase our ability to, if we are going to work remotely, do it in a you know, transparent, open, public way, uh, because I think that's what the American people wanted. They voted for a different voice uh, in 2018. Uh, but largely what we're seeing right now uh, is, you know, Mitch McConnell and, and the president. And I think that uh, that's not the, that's not what the American people voted for in 2018. So we have to get back out there pushing forward, not only our message, but showing the work that we're doing. There is a lot of work happening, uh, but because of some of our uh, tech limitations, it's not always uh, accessible. Are you saying that uh, Congress looks a little like the Saturday Night Live skit of the, trying to use Zoom? If you if you were on uh, it just a just a simple conference call and you would not believe how uh, mute can really frustrate uh, <laughs> it's just entire conversations. I mean that's just a, just one example. So. I saw a tweet yesterday that that someone said, uh, um, "Sorry, you're on mute." A 2020 mem memoir. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was it's like who who will get that first. <laughs> Right. Um, I'm glad you mentioned um, your colleagues and technology. Obviously, one of the reasons I started Tech for Campaigns is, at least on the campaign side, there's there's a deficit there as well. Um, again, just for people, so people can see a visual. Um, I'll throw up a quick slide of of how spending works on the campaign side and the disparity, um, which is that on average, um, the Democrats are spending about five to 10 cents of every dollar. RNC tells their campaigns to spend about 40 cents on every dollar. Um, even though the Obama sort of halo is that everyone was great at tech, um, <clears throat> that hasn't really trickled down at all. Um, and I think particularly with COVID making campaigning online really the only option, I'd love to hear from you, um, Representative Allred, on both how campaigning is changing. I know you're you're amid, in a midst a campaign right now, and um, what you think we as a community can do to help, um, in, in addition to tech for campaigns, because this is a, a big problem overall, but particularly when we can't be doing sort of the retail style politics. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, you know, we had an army of volunteers in 2018 that allowed us to go door to door. You know, Texas, our biggest challenge in many ways, small d democratic challenge, uh, is getting folks out to vote. You know, we have a majority minority state. Uh, we're disproportionately young as well. Uh, we have a lot of folks who you would think are uh, gettable voters for Democrats, but our turnout in some of these communities has been too low. And that's what, one of the reasons why we've generally been at the, in the bottom or in the bottom two or three for turnout uh, in the country. And so what we were able to do was increase our turnout uh, in 2018 pretty dramatically using door-to-door -door techniques. Also, uh, of course, a lot of that for us was using uh, van and mobile van and apps on phones that allowed our volunteers to go out there and, and really micro-target who we were talking to. So that was using tech. Um, but that door-to-door -door interaction is just not going to be most likely possible uh, in the scenario, particularly around uh, election day when you know the CDC director and Dr. Fauci and many people have said that we are expecting to have a resurgence of COVID-19 in the fall coupled with seasonal flu. Uh, so we will be uh, really under 
under a real dark cloud in terms of uh, human interaction. And so we're going to have to figure this out. Uh, and you're right. I think it'll be uh, a question of which side does it better, which side identifies targets and communicates with their voters better online uh, is, is probably the side uh, that's going to come out uh, the best in this scenario. And so for us, it, it, it's, an, it's a focus, but it's also, I think, now uh, an imperative that we have to you know, get the speed on this. And I would say, you know, in terms of the you know, budget allocations and things like that, you know, it does uh, depend on um, you know, the communities that you're talking to and who, how you're trying to reach them. You know, I have uh, an older black community in my district. The best way to reach them is not gonna be through digital ads. It's gonna be through either the mail or the phone or going door to door. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, that you aren't using tech to identify them and also check on them and stay in touch with them and, and very, a whole bunch of kind of behind the scenes use of tech to be efficient uh, in that campaigning. So I, I think that right now we're formulating those plans and those who have good ideas should know that every, all of us who are gonna be the ones who determine whether or not the Democrats keep the house, uh, which is certainly what you know, a seat like mine will determine whether or not we take the Senate, whether or not we're able to uh, get a new president in there. Uh, we are looking for something that will be helpful in, in doing those, that enormous task that I think is probably the most important election uh, in the United States since 1864. So if you have an idea uh, and if you, or if you have things you think we should be doing, uh, we are open to listening to it. And we're certainly, I think, you know, with me being, you know, a younger uh, candidate and member, uh, you know, I'm looking for the, the next idea always and looking for an edge. And also I think that for just, you know, democratic engagement to reach the people we have to reach, which is going to be a real priority because I don't want to see us have a fall off in turnout that not only will have a, a terrible effect in terms of who gets elected, but will set us back on some of the progress that we've worked really hard to make before COVID. Rita, anything to add on the helping on the digital front given, given COVID on campaigning? Uh, no, I, I just want to underscore how important it is. And, and I, again, I, since I spend a lot of my time in the uh, tech startup space looking for um, ways that tech can be leveraged to close gaps of access or opportunity or outcome for low-income communities and communities of color, we see lots of interesting tech startups, for-profit and not-for-profit, that are trying to um, engage voters uh, and trying to engage citizens uh, in, in new ways. Um, all right, I'm gonna ask one more question and then we'll take a couple of questions from the audience. So if you guys have questions, you can start posting them in chat and Brenna will um, be our, our question moderator. Um, you know, you guys have both spent good portions of your careers, um, if not all of your careers, really um, fighting for diversity. Um, there, and you're in uh, different but troubled spaces um, when it comes to diversity. So we're just going to throw up the numbers on um, how it looks in the tech workforce, Congress, the U.S. population, even VC funded founders. I'm sure you guys have all seen this. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to take a minute and open it up to talk about why this is so important, not just in terms, you know, obviously in terms of representation, it doesn't look good. We have, you know, 51% of the population is women, 25% of Congress, 13% of the population is African American, it's 11% uh, of Congress, 1% of funded founders. Um, but I think it's important for, I, I, there's been a lot of talk about diversity and I feel like people say it's important. I think Frida, in a recent interview, someone asked you how tech is doing and you said writ large flunk. Um, so I think it's, in, I'd love to hear how you guys feel about the progress being made and also why it's important. I feel like that has gotten lost. I, I think that people just say, oh, we should have diversity, but they don't really understand the value of it. I'd love to talk a little bit about that. Well, if I could jump in here, Jessica, um, th this is a uh, sobering chart that you've put up here and a very important one to look at 
uh, comparing um, how poorly, you know, the race to the bottom between tech and Congress for the last <laughs> Um, but I do want to say our experience at Cape Or Capital demonstrates, we're tiny, but it demonstrates something else that's possible. Um, so we're closing in on 70% of our founders being women from any background and or uh, men and women of color. We fund more black women entrepreneurs than any other VC firm, which is pathetic because we're small. That means we have more black women founders in our uh, in Cape Or Capital uh, than the billion dollar Sand Hill Road uh, firms. But what we also do, I mentioned Onward built by Bitwise. Bitwise was started by two Latinx founders in Fresno. They focus on what they call underdog cities. We have a portfolio full of companies that are using technology to close these gaps. Um, and I think that if we make that connection, that you can improve lives, you can improve communities, you can close income inequality gaps, wealth inequality gaps, health disparities, educational disparities, you can close all of those by leveraging tech in the right way. And as we were talking about before, by doing public-private partnerships, by increasing um, the tech proficiency of our elected officials, we can solve this. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we often talk about diversity uh, being about the benefit of the folks who actually get the position, who actually get the funding, who actually get the job, who actually get elected. But what all the social science research shows us is that diversity actually helps get, have better outcomes for everyone. That when you have diverse voices at a table, you reach a better decision. And so when you're making any decision, whether it's uh, where to direct funding, whether it's what kind of uh, industry uh, to pursue, whether it's uh, for us legislation that, that should be considered and, and solutions that be, should be considered, you will have a better outcome if you have more diverse voices at the table. And so I, I think that we often, you know, this kind of, uh, paradigm that it's discussed and it's kind of as, as a handout uh, or as something that's given uh, to, and I'm not free to choose and say this at all, but some people kind of make this sound like they are uh, helping folks who otherwise wouldn't get any help. And really you're helping yourself as well. Uh, and you're helping all of us. And so our outcomes in society will be much better. And I, I don't think that it's, a, it's uh, surprising to me that many of the nations that are run by women right now are doing the, the best in fighting COVID-19. Many of the states uh, that are handling uh, this crisis right now, like Gretchen Whitmer in Michigan, uh, are, that are run by women are doing better than some of the other states. I, and I think it's just part of having more diverse voices and having folks who have a different perspective in positions of power and decision-making. That's incredibly important. I'm really proud to be part of a democratic class that was elected in 2018 uh, that is majority women, and that's the most diverse class ever elected to Congress. We came in, of course, with the youngest woman ever elected to Congress, uh, the second youngest ever woman elected to Congress, the youngest black woman ever elected to Congress, my good friend, Lauren Underwood. Uh, and we've added, now we're at 55 members in the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, that has made our caucus better, I, I promise you that. Uh, and we'll make, we'll continue to make Congress better if we're able to stay in our positions and grow into seniority and grow into leadership roles. Well, I, I want to make the connection there between your observations about making Congress better, which of course makes the country better, but also what we find is that entrepreneurs from different backgrounds bring their lived experience to the table and come up with completely different and game-changing ideas for very important, high-impact highly successful for-profit businesses. Um, and so we've just got example after example after example. We put out our first impact report and financial returns last year. And it's just stunning and inspiring and humbling to see if you give voice and you give investment to entrepreneurs who can use their lived experience to come up with great businesses it makes, as the Congressman said, it makes things better for everyone. I'm gonna take one or two questions from the audience quickly. Um, Congressman Allred, Neil Mehta is asking, you mentioned the importance of using digital to reach out to the minority communities, but we also mentioned um, lack of broadband internet access. How, 
how do you uh, see the tension between the two and solve them during this campaign? Well, that's, that's true. Uh, High-speed internet is needed to do discussions like this, uh, but you know, there is a very wide spread usage of smartphones and of, of cell phones, of course. And so that's really, I think, the, the avenue where you can reach folks. Um, many uh, you know, folks in the black community, just like any of us, are living on their phone and using it for every single thing, whether it's news gathering or communication or interacting with their community. And so that's also where we can meet folks. And I think that that's a, a challenge that we can deal with right now, but we have to be better at identifying, particularly transient communities. Uh, and I want to stress that for my district and for any place that's growing rapidly, we've had a million people move from out of state to Dallas uh, since 2010. And so that's, that's not our own internal growth, which is continuing. That's just people moving here. Uh, a lot of that growth has been um, minorities and um, to target and to understand where they are and if they're registered to vote and how we can talk to them is, is the challenge that faces us now in every election cycle because every day we're adding you know, thousands of people uh, to, the, to the, the, the potential voter rolls. Uh, and so that's, that's where we're gonna have to meet people. And I think particularly for our younger folks, uh, our younger voters, where we had a great uh, youth turnout in 2018 in Texas, in part because Beto, uh, I think, really galvanized uh, the youth vote and, and did a great job of doing that. In my district, we did as well. I, I had a very young campaign, had a very young volunteer kind of army of, of fellows of this is college and high school students who worked on our campaign and who I think gave us kind of that uh, sheen that young people are looking for. Um, but to target them uh, and to reach them, it's got to be through their phones, it's got to be through you know, reaching them where they are. Uh, and so th that's the challenge for us, but it's also, I think, an opportunity. And then just as, as a quick ending, um, you know, it's been said, never let a crisis go to waste. Mm -hmm. What, what's the one thing, if you could just pick one thing to come out of this crisis that changes, what, what would that be for each of you? Well, I was a voting rights lawyer, so I'll just say uh, vote by mail um, and the universal access to the ballot uh, is, is, I hope, going to be something that comes out of this because there's a lot that I want to say, of course. There's many, many things that I think we need to change. Uh, I think that I'm hoping that the appetite for real significant change uh, will grow uh, as we come out of this crisis and that we will respond as we did to the Great Depression uh, with uh, substantive programs that can make a big difference on a structural level, as Frida was mentioning. But in order to do any of that, we have to be able to elect officials who will actually put these policies into place. And I've always said that if I could change two things about our democracy, it would be campaign finance and voting. Uh, and I would love to see us, of course, overturn Citizens United and do many things about the role of dark money in politics. I actually had Russian money spent in my race against me. If you followed uh, this Lev Parnas guy who was indicted by the Southern District of New York, well, why was he indicted? It was for funneling money into a congressional race in Texas. It was my congressional race. Uh, we still won, of course, but that shouldn't be happening. My neighbors, the people I grew up with, shouldn't have Russian money being spent to tell them that I was a socialist. But on the voting side, uh, this is, I think, a chance for us to make sure that we reach everyone in a way that's easily accessible for them. You know, I think that uh, moving to vote by mail, as California has done, as many states have done, uh, significantly increased turnout in those states, and it can significantly increase the representation uh, in terms of who's, who actually gets elected. Uh, we need that in Texas. We need that across the country. We're going to be in the midst of another uh, big wave of this, most likely when we vote in November. We cannot have what happened in Wisconsin happen nationally where people are being asked to risk their lives to vote. Uh, and that is something that, as we said, will disproportionately impact the communities that we're talking about here, uh, but also one that I think will result in illegitimate government coming out of it, in my opinion. So I'm hoping uh, that vote by mail uh, will be it's something that we're gonna try to push for, certainly in this package we're doing now, but that every state adopts it, that it, every eligible voter gets a ballot. Uh, it's safe, it can be uh, validated and checked. Uh, and as we've seen in states across the country, it does expand turnout. And when you do that, I think then we can pass the legislation that can solve some of these big, big problems that we're talking about. And I'll just add, we're huge vote by mail fans. Um, even if it gets passed uh, by you and your colleagues, it's still a lot, a lot of the details will be up to the states. And this is why state governments are so important. One of the reasons. Mm -hmm. The one thing I would say in terms of what I hope to come out of the crisis, I think 
uh, I would like to see a resurgence of empathy. I think we need to overcome the blaming each other, the deep divisions to understand that while this pandemic has affected different communities differently, everyone's been affected. Uh, and that to empathize that the next wave of this pandemic, maybe this wave didn't affect me, but the next wave might. And we need to build a social safety net that says we're all in this together. Thank you guys so much. We're, we're out of time today and we want to be respectful of people's time, even though they're uh, coming from home. So thank you, Congressman Allred. Thank you, Frida. Um, we're pleasure. Sure. Hugely appreciative of you guys lending your voice um, this morning. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. We'll do more of these soon. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.